Welcome to the Potter Blog site, Tuesday, October 23rd, 2012. Uh, we believe something of some significance happened in Fukushima on October 14th. And what you see here is an image of the jet stream on October 14th as it existed over Fukushima. Uh, one of the things to notice is we're going to step through this and we're going to show you how this, how this Fukushima jet stream came across as a freight train and impacted uh, Eugene, Oregon. Uh, where there was a detection on the radiation network during a rainstorm of over uh, a thousand counts per minute and then how a few days later the same jet stream impacted uh, Grand Rapids, Minnesota resulting in a uh, hundred and sustained hundred count per minute airborne alert inside of a house and we'll show you how these are actually related uh, to the jet stream uh, back to Fukushima and how there's likely a long half-life fallout uh, in this jet stream. Now, the things to consider, the things we've discovered, uh, our working theories, are that the high short half-life had a high short half-life radiation coming out of Fukushima is uh, from natural radon being unnaturally steamed out of the groundwater in Japan because of the uh, corium being in the groundwater and being hit with groundwater. And then along with that are the uh, particulate and gases coming from the quarium themselves. All the various cobalts, uh, cesium, iodine, the whole nine yards. Now, the thing to consider about this jet stream is it works like a high-speed river. And so if you think of a river and its silt-carrying ability, a high-speed river can carry lots of silt, but the silt falls out of the river uh, when the river slows down. And so what will happen here is for the gaseous products like uh, uh, xenon and uh, some of the iodine products and the radon, uh, they can stay suspended longer in the air and don't require so much the high speed uh, uh, jet stream. But their, your ability to measure them in your rain correlates to how far away you are from the jet stream. Whereas the longer half-life fallout primarily comes, at least in the mid, mid part of the United States, uh, from particulates suspended in the jet stream. So when the jet stream is overhead and you have strong storms and Fukushima is active, one may detect long half-life fallout like we have detected. Uh, when the jet stream is not overhead and you're, close, and you're close to it, you can still detect uh, higher levels of uh, radon coming across the jet stream, but you're less likely to detect the long half-life fallout that extends out into days, months, and years and accumulates in the environment. So what I'm going to do here is, is uh, if you focus here, I'm going to turn on this uh, uh, jet stream animation and we're going to follow it step by step as it comes around and hits Eugene, Oregon and then hits Grand Rapids, Minnesota. So it's currently set on October 14th. So it's stepping every six hours. And you can see here, bang, and then right there, Minnesota. Now it's going to start over again. I'll stop it. Move it forth to October 14th. So basically, what you saw was a continuous freight train of jet stream coming across and hitting Eugene, Oregon, causing a thousand count per minute plus uh, detection in Eugene, Oregon on the radiation network. And, and then causing a 100 count per minute extended detection airborne in uh, Grand Rapids, Minnesota. So now the question comes forth, how can Eugene, Oregon have thousands of counts per minute coming out of this same jet stream, whereas Grand Rapids only has 100 counts per minute? And why is Eugene, Oregon, why was there detection thousands of counts for several minutes, whereas, uh, whereas Grand Rapids, Minnesota was 100 counts per minute for several hours, apparently? Well, the difference is, is there were different kinds of measurements. In Eugene, Oregon, uh, the information we have from the radiation network says that the Geiger counter was pressed up against the window. And what that does is the rain hits the window and uh, basically uh, the radioactive particles tend to plate out on the window. But they don't necessarily stick like they would on a paper towel. So continuous rain can wash them back off. And what I'll show you here is our equivalent here in the uh, Potter Blog site. Uh, when we do uh, tests. Now this is from a August 8th storm here in St. Louis and this is from our outdoor airborne radiation monitor and uh, 
this actually uses the software created for the inspector Geiger counter. So this is the act, this uses observer software. We list it on our uh, uh, blog page on our Amazon link if you want to know what it is. But uh, this has actually been calibrated to work with inspector uh, Geiger counters uh, in professional arenas. So this is about as accurate as you're going to get from a uh, computer-based uh, count per minute analysis. And if you see here, we hit over 40 counts per minute. And this is actually minute by minute counting. And this set off our radiation alert in our house, uh, which our, radi or our, radi sorry, our radiation alert is based on a 30 minute moving average we've set at 50 counts per minute. That's why ours went off, but it only shows 41 counts per minute here. So we went out and we took a swipe of the, uh, of the truck to pick up anything that played it out on the truck to see what the radiation levels would be on our paper towel. And when we did that, we hit 3,000 counts per minute on the paper towel. So an airborne reading showed 41 counts. A paper towel swipe showed uh, 3,000 counts. And I'm going to show you that 3,000 counts here. Now this is from our lead cave lab where we've got two Geiger counters set up. Uh, this one is measuring the paper towel sample. And if you can see in here close, we can zoom in on that. You can see it's already showing 2,630 counts per minute, uh, whereas the uh, background sample measuring a control paper towel sample is only measuring in the 30s. I'll turn this on for a second. And it actually does go up and hit 3,000 counts per minute as we zoom in here. I'm not going to let it play the whole time, but as you can see there. So if we go back to the beginning, so we have 41 counts airborne, but when you take the swipe, we hit 3,000 counts per minute. This is, in essence, what happened in uh, Eugene, Oregon. Uh, Eugene, Oregon, we believe the, uh, uh, the rain played it out on the window, and hence the high counts, but for a short period of time, as the next batch of rain came in and moved on. Uh, when it hit uh, Grand Rapids, Minnesota, there was no rain, but they were on the edge of the uh, jet stream where the particulate can fall out. Now what we're going to do here is we're going to step through this. This is a close-up and I'm going to show you where this wave of a uh, Fukushima jet stream came in and hit Eugene, Oregon and we're going to go up to Grand Rapids, Minnesota. So you can see there, there we're hitting uh, uh, Eugene, Oregon on the 19th and what we're going to do here is take a look at the radar and let's see, it gets to the 19th, around the 23rd. Let's let it run for a second. So 18, 19. So you can see where the radar, where the rain developed in Eugene, Oregon. So let's go back to the jet stream map here. So here we are on October 19th, Eugene, Oregon. Now watch as we step forward through this. And how it moves up. And then right about there, bam, we're over uh, Grand Rapids, uh, Minnesota. I'm going to take it backwards now so you can see it. So watch here and you can see how in a couple of days the center of this moves back. And 21st, and we're right in here. We come. 19th. This is Zulu time, so the, off, the hours are off by about 6 for my location. So let's step forward again. And so two days for uh, weather travel from California to out here is not uh, unheard of. It's probably more like a day and a half, I think, really. But in essence, we have the same storm. Now, if you look up here at Alaska... Now, we've got some information from Anchorage, Alaska, that came out of uh, RadNet. So we're going to go back here again to October 18th. There you go forward. So here we are, October 18th. You can see a bit of this jet stream. And we're going to look at Anchorage, Alaska. We're going to go to Alexander Higgins' blog. And he, kindly enough, has put up all the EPA graphs of one easy-to-read location. But we focused in on Anchorage, Alaska. Now what drew our attention to it is this long spike starting October 11th, building up and then decaying out. 
Now, this is a data generated by the EPA. Now, the EPA reviews and approves their data, which means it's been censored. But uh, there's only so much they can hide. It's harder to hide trends when censoring data. And this is the gamma spectrometry. Again, you can see the spikes around the same time period. And one other thing we discovered uh, from a poster on radiation network, sorry, the radiation conversation, uh, this is a good website, Vital One here, uh, posted to a, uh, a high alert level that was in Hawaii on the radiation network. And they took a picture of it here. And let's see if we can zoom to it. So there was also a high reading in Hawaii. And this was on October 22nd. So it's still ongoing. So this should... Uh, be impacting the United States and the jet stream again uh, the next few days.